1 Kings chapter 20, verse 23. I hope I've given you time to be there. Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But if we fight them against them in the plain, surely we will be stronger than they. So the enemy of Israel, Syria, said, oh, those Israelites are God. Their God's the God of the hills. That's why they were stronger than us. But if we fight them in the plain or in the valley, surely we will be stronger than they. By the help of the Lord, I want to preach this thought, the God of hills and valleys. The God of hills and valleys. Lord Jesus, your word is anointed. I'm asking you to anoint my mind and anoint the ears of your hearers. Melt our hearts together for the Spirit to accomplish what it has purposed to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said amen. Living room check. Did you say amen? Everybody say amen. Praise God. God bless you. The God of hills and valleys. Satan is not God's enemy. Did you hear me? Satan is not God's enemy. How can the two even be in the same conversation? Satan is not God's enemy. Satan is our enemy. Now, now let, me, let me tell you what Jesus said to that end. He told Peter in Luke 22, he said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I'm telling you, Satan is our enemy. Jesus even said in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Satan is our enemy. But let me tell you something else. Satan's not God's enemy. Satan is our enemy. But thirdly, Satan is not supreme. Jesus is the victor over death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Let me go back over that. John 10, the thief has come only to steal, kill, and destroy. But here's how I know Jesus is supreme. He said, I have come that they might have life and that more abundantly. Oh, yeah. Satan said, uh, I want to sift you as wheat, Peter. But the rest of that story in Luke twenty two thirty one 31 says that, that I prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I'm telling you, our God is all in all. Hallelujah. Our God is all-knowing. That means he's omniscient. Our God is all-powerful. That means he is omnipotent. Our God is everywhere present. That means he is omnipresent. Satan is not any of those things. Satan is not everywhere present. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. But my God is. And I've come to preach to you that that God is the God of the hills and the valleys. Hallelujah. Now, if you go to chapter 20 that I read from today, verse 1, I want to tell you a story. And if the children are listening right now, I want you to listen up because you're going to get a good, fascinating Bible story. There was a king by the name of Ben-Hadad. He was the king of Syria. And the Bible says, as you see in verse 1, that he gathered all of his forces together. Thirty-two kings were with him. Wow. And not only that, horses and chariots. And all of these kings went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. <clears throat> now, you have to understand, ancient kings of these days, they often waged this kind of warfare. 
what they would do is they would gather a large enough army, and often they didn't even have to fight the battle. They would just save the expenditure of the manpower, and they would just merely surround them and, uh, and get them to pay tribute or payment of, of what they probably would have gotten as an aggressor, stealing the plunder had they gone to battle. Now, watch what happens in verse 2 when the enemy declares. The Scripture says that he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, This is what Ben-Hadad says. Your silver and gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. The enemy said they're mine. But notice in verse 4 what happens when God's people gives in. The king of Israel said, just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. Why? Why do we agree with what the enemy says? Satan lies. And then we respond, just as you say. You see, Ahab's submission to Ben-Hadad, that, that really suggests that Israel had lost uh, uh, hope, or at least they saw little hope for their military to be victorious over the Syrians. And so they negotiated a settlement that would end this siege of Samaria and spare Ahab the king's life and avoid all of this plundering of the city. So I'll tell you why we say, sure, just as you say. I'll tell you why often we say, well, the enemy said it's mine and we agree with it. It's because we have lost hope. I have for many years in ministry seen people, they may not have said these words, but this is what they believed. The way it is right now is the way it's always going to be. And we believe that. It's a lie from the devil. And he says, it's mine. And we say, whatever you say. But I'm going to tell you today, let us never place ourselves into the position of the enemy settling the terms. Don't lose hope. Hallelujah. I said don't lose hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not what the enemy says. He loves to intimidate you into hopelessness. He loves for you to buy in to what you're hearing around you. But I'm telling you, it's what God says. Who has the final say? Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, has the final say. <laughs> No matter what the news says, no matter what the doctor says, I'm telling you, we don't have to believe the report of the enemy. I shall believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Are you getting this? The enemy just came up and said, hey, it's mine. And they said, whatever you say. But I'm telling you what, if we don't take a stand, look what happens according to verse 5. The enemy demands even more. You think it's going to stop with your truce right here? Oh, no, no, no. The Bible says in verse 5, the messengers came again and said, this is what Ben-Hadad says. I sent to demand your silver and gold and your wives and children. That's what we just heard. Watch this. But what about this time tomorrow? I'm going to send my officials to search your palaces and the houses of your officials, and they're going to seize everything you value and carry it away. I told you the plot thickens. Ben-Hadad now, his new demand, required them to surrender the city to his forces. And it said everything you value, <clears throat> everything that is important to you, so the king, along with the elders, thank God, they decided this is where we draw the line with the Syrians. And the Bible says they chose to go to war rather, watch this, than lose their legal status as citizens of Samaria. They said, wait a minute, you're not going to steal my citizenship. Mm. 
You're not going to take my legal status. I'm going to tell you right now, I read in the Bible, my status of a spirit-filled filled believer in Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought you, hallelujah, into an adoption of sonship. And in him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Don't lose your status. I said don't let the devil talk you out of who you are. First Peter chapter number 2 verse 9 says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you can proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, here's my status, now I am a people of God. I had not obtained mercy, but now I've obtained mercy. Don't let the devil steal your status in him. Oh, hallelujah. You got time for one more? Philippians 3 verse 20. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. Your citizenship isn't Baltimore, Maryland. It isn't any other state or country from which you're listening right now. If you're a born again believer, he said we're eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power which which he will bring everything under his control. I'm telling you, this body is going to fade away, but there's coming a day if you won't trade out, if you won't sell out, there's hope you don't have to give in to the voice of the enemy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. All right, let's look at this story. So here's what they said in verse 9. They got a little backbone. They said, to Ben-Hadad's messengers, you tell my lord the king, your servant will do all the demanded the first time, but this demand I cannot meet. They left and took the answer back to Ben-Hadad, and you drop down to verse 12. Ben-Hadad heard the message while he and the kings, remember there was 32 of them, they were drinking in their tents, and he ordered his men, prepare to attack. So they prepared to attack the city. But verse 13, I love this, this preamble here, uh, th this phrase that says, Meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, This is what the Lord says. Do you see that vast army? I, I need you to remember that. That vast army? I'm going to give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, let me tell you, backslidden Ahab had not sought God's help in this crisis that was confronting his city. But the Lord, who is so merciful and gracious, he said, I'm going to reveal myself another time to my king and my people, and I'm going to do it through deliverance. So the Bible says in verse 21, the king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and chariots and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Oh, you've won a victory here, but i got to warn you. Go strengthen yourself. Take note and see what you should do. Because in the spring of the year, the king of Syria is coming back against you. He said, I don't want you to get too confident here, Ahab. This recent military victory I gave you, I'm trying to get you to depend on the God of Israel. And that's when it says in verse 23 that I read to you, when the Syrians were defeated, the Bible says those servants of the king of Syria said to him, you know why we lost? Their God is gods of the hills. That's why they were stronger than we. But I've got this idea, king. If we fight against them in the plain or in the valley, surely we will be stronger than they. Now, now hang on. You've you got to catch this. Once again, to the original audience of that day, those ancient civilizations, they tended to believe, this is important, that gods were territorial. 
and that outside their territories, they were virtually powerless. So they said, their God, Israel's God, is a God of the hills. It was an expression of a pagan idea that a deity's power extended only over the limited real estate of that particular jurisdiction. I don't, I could say more about this. There was a, oh, I won't do it, okay. I'm just telling you, it's other places than in the Bible than here. The Syrians, the Armenians, whatever translation you're reading, they believe that the outcome of the military conflict depended on the relative strength of the gods of the opposing forces rather than even the strength of of the two armies. And so their strategy was to fight the next battle in a way that was advantageously maximizing the strengths and the weaknesses of these deities involved. So look at verse 24 as the story goes on. He said, the, the servant said, so do this, king. Dismiss the kings. How many were, uh, how many kings were there? Come on, kids, help me. There was 32 kings. Dismiss them all from their position and put captains or other officers in their places. And you shall muster an army like the army that you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them. What's it say? In the plain. We're going to get them out of the hills, and we're going to get to the valley. And surely, we will be stronger than them. And so the king listened to their voice and did that. And if you look at verse 26, so it was, just like the man of God said, in the spring of that year, Ben-Hadad mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were mustered and given provisions, and they went against them. Now watch this. Look at it. Now, the children of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats. You remember, Syrian had, Syria had a vast army. In fact, this Bible says they filled the countryside. So you got this huge army, and the Bible says Israel's coming against them like two little flocks of goats. If you're looking for some, you can find them by the white marshmallow. There they are. Can you imagine that? Look at this. It's a vast army, and they indeed gathered in the valley or the plain or the countryside. So this was their, this was their belief. This was their theory. We're going to get them there, and we're going to win. So what happened? Oh, verse 28, the man of God shows up again and says to the king of Israel, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he's not God of the valleys. I'm going to deliver all this great multitude into your hand. Here it comes again. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you, Israel was not right with God. Ahab the king was not right, okay? And, and they were worshiping Baal along with the one God, Jehovah. And so they were just proclaiming that, that, that its God was no different from any other territorial God. According to the words of the prophet, he said, I'm going to try to help apostate Israel to, to, to understand that this victory needs to correct your theology that there's only one God and there's no other God. You shall know by experience that I... I am the Lord. God will again demonstrate that he is a sovereign ruler over nature, over history, over pagan deities. They are all powerless before him. Let me tell you something right now. God is not a God of territories. He's a God of hills and valleys. Oh, come on, Abundant Life. When we take new territory, it's not retrieving something new for God. <laughs> like, woo, we're doing God a favor. God said, oh, look, Gabe, <laughs> we got some new territory. No, no, no. He owns the cattle on the thousand hills. What we're retrieving is what was already given to us by God. 
Sinful humanity willingly gave back the dominion that God had already given. I love this. In short, taking new territory is God's plan for the church, not God's need to gain power. It's just part of his plan that the church is going to take back what they gave up in their sinful humanity and Satan's agenda. And I'm going to tell you right now, in the midst of our circumstances, we're still going to take new territory because he's an almighty God and he is all powerful and he's a God of the hills and the valleys. There's nothing our God cannot do. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, the devil may have territories, but God doesn't. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Satan has jurisdictions, but God doesn't. Now, I could support that statement. In fact, I got thoughts written down to do it. But uh, if the Lord will let me, come back Thursday night, and maybe I'll explain all that. Kind of like I remember my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were praying up front for people in a revival, and a lady came uh, to pray. And they were on both sides of her, uh, earnestly helping her as she sought the Lord. And uh, finally she stopped. She looked at him. She said, if I promise to come back tomorrow night, will you let me go? So, so if you promise to come back Thursday, will you let me preach that and teach that here, okay? What happened? We got to get back to this story. What happened in verse 29? Oh, exactly what the word of the Lord said and exactly who our God is. Two armies camped opposite each other for seven days. And on the seventh day, the battle began. And the Israelites, you remember them? They're two little flocks of goats plus God, <laughs> and they killed a vast multitude of 100,000 Syrian foot soldiers in one day, and the rest fled into the town of Aphek, but they thought they were safe. They weren't. A wall fell on them and killed another 27,000, and Ben-Hadad fled into the town and hid in a secret room. Oh, you can say I'm crazy, but I believe there's enough power in the name of Jesus to get the enemy me back into his secret room. There is nothing my God cannot do. And your identity and your status, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It's not time for us to recoil. It's time for us to go on the advance. Our God is the God of the valleys and the plains. Come on now, don't allow Satan to deceive you into thinking that God's power is territorial. You say, well, that kind of sounds crazy. I don't even know that thing's going around. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to work. If you're not careful, if, if, here's what we could say. Well, God will work here, but not there. That's territory. That's subjects. That's compartmentalizing God. But the truth is, God is God, both of the hills and the valleys. Hear me. Just because we have never been to this place before doesn't mean that God hasn't been to this place. Some of you may have heard me say before, I shared it not too long ago with this church. I have faced some things in the last few months that I have never faced in 38 years of ministry. And guess what? The list is growing I've never pastored this way. I've never faced what I'm trying, I'm facing right now. And if you're not careful, the enemy will say, ah, yeah, they were good as long as they had all of their little, their little comforts and the things they were used to. But oh, if you just let us get it down there. No, no, no. I'm telling you, I'm not even saying Satan's doing this. He might want to capitalize on it. In reality, God might be trying to get our attention just like he did Ahab and say, look, you haven't called on me, but 
I'm going to put you in a position to show you that I am God of the valleys just as much as I am God of the hills. Hear me today. God wants his church to believe that with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to God right now. Hallelujah. I receive it, Lord. I believe it right now, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Is this making sense? And let me say this. In Israel's history, since the days of Joshua, right now in our Bible story, we're in the days of kings, which wasn't even God's idea. But since the days of Joshua, Moses' successor, scholars will tell you that Israel's soldiers had a reputation for being superior fighters in the hills. But they were ineffective in the open plains and valleys because, you see, they didn't use chariots in battle. Horse-drawn chariots, they were useless in a hilly terrain or dense forest. It wouldn't work. They could easily be run down the great numbers of foot soldiers on the plains. That's why they stayed away from it. So hear me today. What Ben-Hadad's officers didn't understand, that it was not chariots. It was God that made the difference in the battle. Does that make more sense to you when the psalmist said in 20 verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. That's what they may trust in. But we will remember the name of our God, hallelujah, just because the valley warfare was unusual or unknown doesn't mean the victory would not come because God, hear me, has never been the God of the hills alone. He is God of hills and valleys. He is God. Drop the mic. Too expensive. I won't do it. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me today? Are, are you getting this in your spirit? Just because you have never been in this valley doesn't mean that Jesus hasn't won the victory. But you've got to be aware of God's strategy. <laughs> he's in this. He knows what he's doing. But Satan also has a strategy. He wants to cause fear and doubt because this territory is unfamiliar to us. I'm going to tell you, don't become territorial, compartmentalized in your thinking because this place is not unfamiliar to God. He's the God of the hills and he's God of the valleys. He's God when the sun shines and he's God when it rains. My God is God and there's no one else like him and we need to lift up our spirit and rely on Jesus. Oh hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Just respond to the Lord right now and say, Jesus, help me. Whatever I'm facing in my life right now, whatever I'm facing in my life right now, it'll work. It'll work. I'm going to tell you, friend of abundant life, abundant life family, are you hearing me today? This valley will not bring the church down. Because he's God of the plains, just like he is the hills. It's not going to bring you down if you remain faithful to that God of the hills and valleys. And don't you see in our story, God in his mercy gave backslidden King Ahab and Israel a victory to show them that he's God, period. Hallelujah. Now hear me today. Listen carefully. Sometimes God allows and sometimes God sends us to the valley. Oh yeah. Sometimes God allows the valleys to come. Sometimes he sends those valleys. You remember the Old Testament character Job? that lost all of his land and family. 
That test was God's idea. He said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? The rise in power of Syria and these other countries, Assyria and Babylon, was so Israel and Judah could turn to God in the valley. There's a lot of conversation and speculation and prayer. God, why? What's all going on with all of this? But let me tell you something. At minimum, I personally believe more than that, but at minimum, I believe he's telling Israel, you've seen me work in the hills through Joshua, your leader, but I'm trying to show you that I'm God of the valley as well. The enemy would say they've never done ministry solely online in the plains, only in person on the hills. But what the enemy does not get, it's never been about a building. It's never been about a campus or a certain method. It's always been about the church of the living God, regardless of the methodology. I'm trying to hurry. You hear angels playing in the background. I'm about to land. But let me tell you real quickly. In the book of Acts, when persecution came, it scattered the church from Jerusalem. The Bible says in Acts 8.1, Saul approved of their killing him, Stephen, the first martyr. Hear this, Acts 8.1. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Oh, we lost the church. What's happening? No, no. Except the apostles were scattered. They went from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And if you read Acts 1-8, they were following the blueprint that God had set out. You're going to be my witnesses. Come on, help me. In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And it took a persecution to get them out of Jerusalem. But it didn't destroy the church. And the church didn't just survive. It thrived. Oh, yeah, it did. Drop down to Acts 8 excuse me, Acts 11, verse 19. Those who had been scattered by the persecution bro that, that broke out when Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. But verse 20 says, there's some that got it to the Greeks and the Gentiles. And in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now there's your scripture. That's where we are. Acts 11, 21. The hand of the Lord is with us. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? I've been trying to preach it. I've been trying to tell you that the hand of the Lord is with us. But hear me today. That's not the end of the verse. And that's not the end of our mission. And a great number of people believe and turn to the Lord. I'm not just planning on being safe in the hand of God. But I'm believing for people to believe and turn to the Lord. Why? Because the church is not a building. The church is people. We're making disciples in this valley. Oh, come on. That's it. That's it. Come on. Talk to God wherever you are right now. That's it. In the name of Jesus. If the church will exercise God's authority, there's no limitations with him.